Hello and welcome to Corbett's Comments. Today I'm commenting on Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 21, which of course gives us the Ten Commandments. Now one of the recent popular comedy gags is to have a funny list of some kind. Jeff Foxworthy, of course, is famous for his list that helps us decide if we're a redneck or not. And late night host David Letterman always included a top 10 list in each of his shows. Now, I saw one the other day that was called Top 10 Indicators That You Drink Too Much Coffee. Although I was convicted about this, let me go ahead and share this list with you. 10. Juan Valdez names his donkey after you. 9. You get a speeding ticket even when you're parked. 8. You watch videos and fast forward. 7. The nurse needs a scientific calculator to take your pulse. 6. Your lips are permanently stuck in the sipping position. 5. You can jumpstart your car without cables. 4. You've worn out the handle on your favorite coffee mug. 3. Starbucks owns the mortgage on your house. Two, you're so wired you pick up FM radio. And number one, instant coffee takes too long. Now God has his top 10 list too. And he gave this list to Moses to pass on to Israel. And though times have changed, God never does. And his top 10 list stands even today. We need to know it, honor it, and live it. First, God's list tells us how to live with Him in verses 1 through 8. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit, any, acquit anyone who misuses His name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now God's two main concerns are His name and His creation. And both of these are addressed in this list. His name takes priority and comes first in the list, and His creation comes next, last but not least. Before God gave His list, though, He reminded them who He is. He is the God who delivered them and the God who is to be their Lord and their God. These same factors hold true for us today. God has not changed and His love has not changed. And although our world is very different today in many superficial ways, God's care for His people has not changed in the least. God's basic assertion here is that He is a monopoly. Although we believe in the free market in economics, uh, we also know that God accepts no competition in His realm. God wants to be our only God and our only Lord. He wants to have our full attention. As Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew also tells us in chapter 10, verses 31 through 33, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Make no mistake, God is calling us to make Him our first priority. The only way we can live in harmony with Him is to make Him our first priority. We also see that God's list tells us how to live with people in verses 9 through 17. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, uh, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord has, uh, is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, God loves His creation, and He wants to protect it, and He wants it to live in harmony. After He created each thing, He said that it was good. And after He created people, He said it was very good. Now, the horror of having His creation ruined by sin was something unspeakable. When I was a company commander in the Army, one of my unit's cooks was a young soldier who had just completed his training. During a field exercise, he baked a beautiful cake for dessert, which was ruined when a folding table collapsed. He was so upset that uh, yet he went on to bake a second cake. And when that one was accidentally knocked to the ground too, he was absolutely crushed to the point he almost burst into tears. Yet the dis disappointment that he felt was nothing compared to that of God when his creation was ruined by sin. God's list reminds us that when we sin against another person, we also sin against God. Jesus told us this when the prodigal son that he had sinned against God and his father. The person we offend is God's creation. And, and that person is loved by God. And remember, too, Jesus died for the person that we offend. So God's list tells us how to live with our loved ones, our neighbors, our employees, with anyone in the world. If we make God our first priority, that will affect all of our lives, including how we treat people God's greatest creation. We also see that God's list is impossible in verses 19 through 21. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. You know, the Israelites reacted to God's list with fear, and rightfully so. They were afraid of what they saw, and they were afraid of what they heard. They wanted to turn around and run. Now, we too often want to run and hide, the way Adam and Eve did in the garden. We know that we get distracted from our walk with God. We, we see how hard it is to live with family and friends and neighbors and co-workers. And we can't be honest with each other. As one lady used to say, I told the truth as I knew it at the time. The Bible also confirms what we know instinctively. We are unable to keep the law of God. As Paul confessed in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right here with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. The law does not save us, but it is valuable because it does show us weaknesses. It's like a mirror. It only reflects our life. And we get so frustrated with it, we give up trying. But this is what, not what God wants us to do. In our own power, of course, there's no way to please God. But the fault is not the law, which is good and right, but our own character, which is frail and weak and limited. Fortunately, we see that God's list is fulfilled in Christ Jesus, as seen in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. God knows we can't keep the law. So he had two choices. Either destroy us or help us. In righteousness, he could have destroyed us, but in love, he decided to help us. So Jesus came to save us and to fulfill the law. He was totally righteous, and he fulfilled the law completely. His dying paid the price for our failure to keep the law, and his rising from the grave defeated the power of sin and gave us the power to keep the law. Yet, God still expects us to respect his law in our own personal lives. God still expects us to be righteousness, to be righteous, and He still expects us to do things His way. He expects us to try to do the right thing. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness." Jesus fulfilled the law, not so that we could ignore it, but so that He could help us live it out in His power. Now, how are we doing with God's top ten list? He expects us to pass the test, and He gives us help to do just that. Are we making the grade? If not, if we repent, He will help us. Thanks for watching. Every blessing. I'm Dr. Otis Corbett.